Welcome to the Writer Center Virtual Craft Chat, where we talk a little less about what an author wrote and a little more about how the person wrote it. I am thrilled to welcome Masha Rumer, whose book dropped um, today, tomorrow, yesterday, very recently. Um, and I'm not going to go through her bio because that's on the website. So, uh, Masha, if you would start by reading a couple of a couple of minutes worth to us to just get the flavor of this excellent and really interesting and challenging book. Challenging in a good way, not in like a Game of Thrones. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Amy and Zach and the Writer Center. I'm really honored to be here. I've attended previous events online, hopefully at some point in person, and I'm, I'm so delighted to, to be um, hosted by you. Um, so this is my new book, Parenting with an Accent. It officially, the on sale official date is, is uh, November 30th. So that um, should be very, very soon. Um, Excuse so me, the book pre order, pre order. Pre orders pre are very important as well. Go ahead. Don't wait for November 30th. Buy now, buy often. <laughs> you can pre order it, yes, in um, the, this uh, hardbound version. Also, there's the audio recording and there's also the ebook available um, at your local store, indie bookstore seller and booksellers and um, so on. But thank you so much, all of you, for being here. I'm, I'm really honored to, to be hosted here. So um, I will read from an excerpt from the book. The, the challenging part was choos choosing what to read because this book is uh, a combination of personal narrative, kind of a journey, a personal journey for me, which is combined with a lot of research um, and interviews, so qualitative and quantitative research. But I think in the beginning, I'm going to read actually just from the beginning of the book, which is the personal uh, part, which has not entirely to do with parenting, but kind of gives an introduction to what the book is about. Um, the book is the book. This does mention a little bit about faith, which I can get into a little bit more in detail later. But it's not about faith per se, um, and it also begins with the holidays, which where which are upon us, depending on which holiday you celebrate. Um, all right. So uh, the first chapter is called "I Am the Grinch Who Stole." Christmas. Um, and this is a personal story before it goes into research. Um, and this is the part that I'm going to read. Um, when Christmas rolls around, just about every child around me puts on an adorable fluffy dress or a sweater vest, sits on Santa's lap and sings carols from memory. Even my quiet California town, where the speed limit is capped at 25 miles an hour, draws visitors from all over to stroll through its Christmas tree lane a spectacular show of lights. By City Hall, tab dancers dressed like Christmas trees shimmy to Santa Claus is coming to town as the town folks, townsfolk cheer them on. Like the neighbors, I get misty when I hear the silent night melody on the radio. I dress my children in outfits of red and green and invite their friends over for cookie decorating party. Holiday music plays on repeat in my home and the scent of yuletide and sparkling, sparkling cranberry candles wafts through the living room. But the trouble is, I'm an imposter. It's not really my holiday. My holiday is Hanukkah, which I knew nothing about when I was growing up. I come from a place where religion was considered opiate, the opiate for the masses, and Jewish people, like myself, often hid their heritage. Instead, I grew up with an atheist sort of Christmas in Leningrad. Soviet Union. There, people ate caviar and fawned over Santa's blonde granddaughter, Snigurichka, the snow maiden, on New Year's Eve. But with my two children and an American husband who was brought up in a Christian household, we embraced the secular pageantry of Christmas and the spirit of Hanukkah and New Year's too, as evidenced by the menorah and the Douglas fir. Look, Leah, the Russian Santa is just like the American Santa you saw last week, I explained to my three-year-old daughter as I coax her to go to a Russian holiday party organized by a local language school. Except the Russian Santa got this granddaughter who looks like Elsa. You love Elsa, don't you? Elsa is the lead character in Frozen, my daughter's favorite Disney cartoon. She agrees to go. We get in the car. When we arrive at the community center rec room, Russian Santa pounds his silver staff against the floor. He jokes in a booming voice that he's already knocked back a few drinks in the morning and winks at the snow maiden. The noise lulls my son to sleep in his baby carrier and he misses the whole thing. My daughter, on the other hand, is awake and she is terrified. She yanks on my sleeve and demands that we leave. 
On the drive back, I pop in a disc with an iconic Russian holiday song, In the Forest a Fir Tree Was Born. As we roll down the suburban California roll, road, the song's familiarity fills me with longing. What's that music? Leah asks from the back seat of the car. I'm overjoyed at her question. Maybe now is that special moment to share the family traditions with my kids. All of the traditions, not just the ones sanctioned by the upscale home furnishing catalogs. I can't wait to tell Leah about the sledding and the people in fur hats stocking up on smoked fish, about the schoolgirls with bows on their hair caroling across 11 time zones. We'll visit when you're older, I want to promise to Leah. You'll meet your cousins and go to the ballet and eat tons of pastries and eat sea fountains made of gold. Well, Leah, I start, this is a Russian holiday song because you are a Russian girl, right? No, Leah retorts, I English girl. My daddy sings another jingle bells. Can we listen to that? <sighs> maybe she, when she's older. I turn the American radio station on. And when she's older, maybe I'll also tell her about my last December in Russia, about how instead of decorating our tree, my family secretly sold off most of our possessions, our books, the family china, my old doll in a fuzzy blue cardigan, the entire apartment of my childhood, with the furniture and the wallpaper and the house plants still in it, was gone in one fell swoop days before our departure. I'll tell her about the overnight train from St. Petersburg to Moscow, taking my parents, brother and me to a plane bound for America. Boarding the train to Moscow, I wasn't thinking about the crumbling regime in poverty where thieves yanked earrings out of women's earlobes and war veterans sold medals on the sidewalk in order to buy bread. I didn't even hear the swirling rumors about a pogrom being planned in my city and my parents' co-workers offering to hide us. I just helped put, push the suitcases into the train and clung to the window, clutching an envelope with photographs of all that was familiar, of all that was about to become the past. Just before the clock struck midnight, a haunting classical melody blared from the station speakers. The train jerked and began to move. My grandparents, aunts, and uncles on the platform scurried after it. They waved and wept and said something about writing letters, their breath swirling in the cold. They wafted in and out of the snow streaked light. My grandfather Abram's walk resembled a march. An eye patch covered the place where his eye had once been, which he'd lost defending his city in battle. I put drops in his remaining eyes so many times to keep it healthy. But now he wasn't really seeing me. He just marched alongside the window, trying to keep pace. His chin was propped high and his teeth were clenched in an emotionless smile. The train sped up. The people on the platform disappeared as the snow kept falling. Thank you. Um, thank you. I, well, that's gonna jump me right into my, my first question. We're gonna skip the tell us who you are because I think you just shared a lot of who you are. Um, that was incredible. Um, so when I saw the title, um, Parenting with an Accent, I, I uh, assumed it was going to be a sort of how-to book, but the book is much, much more than that. It's, um, it has a, more of a chronology, uh, getting into backstory. Um, so that which to me gave the parenting the parenting parts and there are the parenting parts uh, much more depth and structure. So um, how did you can you discuss how you came up with the structure, um, where you decided to start and the the narrative arc, which um, that's my hand the narrative arc. There was uh, there was there is definitely so I tried to structure it definitely with the narrative arc. Um, I never envisioned this to uh, to be a kind of a how to book in case and, and in fact actually. I um, got an offer of representation from a literary agent, uh, which I, I really admired and I just truly admired the work that she does. Um, but she had a vision that this would be a how-to book. And I, I could not have it be a how-to book because I, I firmly believe that there's no one way to parent um, a child and there's definitely no one way to be an immigrant. So um, what I really wanted this book to do is something that I wish I had, you know, I read when I was 
first starting out on this journey, you know, as an immigrant, but certainly as an immigrant parent, um, something that I could just relate to and commiserate with. Um, I didn't really find that when I became a parent, which was to me almost like a culture shock all over again. I had so many questions. I felt lonely, confused. Uh, like there were so many resources available, social media in person, um, parenting approaches and my own culture that I come from. And I just did not know what to do. There, I didn't find a lot of voices um, that I could relate to and commiserate with or just even laugh at. By the way, this book is not like, this was kind of a <laughs> sad part. The book is not as sad. It definitely gets deep into topics, but it's not all about loss. And, you know, it's, there are some, hopefully some funny parts. Um, oh, uh, not, yeah. not at all. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, I, I mean, I didn't find it, I, I didn't find it sad. I found, or happy. I found it human and very, um, so I want to know, I'm going to take you and hold you by your ankles and shake you upside down and find out how you did this. Yes. Um, so, um, what was your original idea, um, and um, how much how much does the final piece, which uh, follows this narrative arc, um, from an immigrant couple trying to find, or uh, you know, you you describe it. You know, I would say the idea is actually fairly similar to what I initially envisioned because this was a very um, I had a very strategic approach to this. I've always wanted to write um, a book. I mean, I actually had like a collection of short stories and essays in the works, and a lot of it was about immigrant identity, um, not a, you know whether a parent or not a parent. Um, and then, in fact, my husband got me uh, for Valentine's Day a gift on writing a proposal um, at a, an esteemed place um, in where we live uh, called the San Francisco Writers um, Grotto. And I went there and when I came back, I had this idea. I just like sat down in the middle of the night and I plotted out all the chapters. Um, initially- I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but for the asp aspirational writers, what year was that? This was, oh, that was four years ago. <laughs> so boom, four years. That's yeah, great. four years ago, that was a very long time ago. As soon as I came back, I knew what I wanted this book to be. And it was not just a collection. It maybe borrowed some pieces that I've published before. Um, I decided to first start with a, like a like an article, like an essay that kind of sort of encapsulated what I hoped. And this was a piece about how fun and difficult and sometimes crappy it is to be a bilingual parent. Because when you try to raise kids with your native language, it's, it's very difficult. And even though we see a lot of resources, now it's a little bit more. But initially it used to be, oh, if you want to raise your children bilingually, here is what you do. It's very easy. You just have to follow the structure and everything will turn out well. Well, nothing, you know, when you're a parent turns out just like, you know, the books tell you the articles and especially not when you are an immigrant parent and you have all these languages and cultures to balance. So I found myself feeling guilty all the time. I heard those conversations around me all the time. Like, am I doing the right thing? Am I disappointing my ancestors? Am I going to be punished? Am I really fitting in appropriately or socializing appropriately? Am I being a good enough parent for my culture um, and you know the culture that I want my children to celebrate and myself as an immigrant? So the piece talked a lot about by um, bilingualism. Actually, that, that part of the excerpt was borrowed from that article. And the article, I wanted to kind of test the waters and the article sort of became viral. And um, from there, I started publishing all those other pieces I've had written about the various aspects of being an immigrant and a parent. Some of them I published even before the, that class. Um, and eventually I put together a proposal which didn't just start with parenting, but started with my journey to the United States. Um, so there's a ch first chapter is a journey to the United States, kind of a background of immigration to show how it relates to you know, where we are today. Um, a lot of the problems immigrants have experienced you know, for generations are still with us. You know, mistrust by the native born people, um, challenges with assimilation or acculturation, um, you know, language loss. People, uh, immigrants lose language by the third generation, typically their native language. And it's been the same since the turn of the 19th century or 20th century rather and today, it's about the same. Um, and many other factors of acculturation are still the same. Um, so very, and sometimes there's, you know, nativism, like we perhaps saw quite recently as well. Um, but that's been the case for generations also and centuries. So the first chapter is just about my immigration journey and then dating. 
um, because that's kind of the process, right? You, you know, arrive, you kind of start figuring out, you know, if you have a partner with a child with a partner, how are you going to navigate various cultural proclivities and uh, surprises? So there's certainly my story there. There's research about um, how, uh, you know, what it's like for, you know, sociology, what it's like for people to date uh, from different cultures. And then it begins with the parenting. So, uh, so yeah, that's a perfect segue into, into the question of research. So um, the book is, is part, um, maybe memoir, but also very much reported. Um, and you used a lot of, um, you cite a lot of books and essays, but you also did a lot of interviews. Um, so can you talk about, I mean, how, as a writer, did you, um, how did you, did you use post-its? Did you use Excel? How did you, how did, how did you go about this? And how did you decide um, what to do and where to put it all? I started with post-its. I had this really <laughs> cool board that I bought at like a craft store nearby. And I was like, oh, this is great. This is this chapter, this chapter. And each one has a post-it of different colors. I felt so accomplished. I was like, yes, I have this book in front of me. This is going to happen. And then of course, COVID happened and some of my interviews had to be canceled. And it just didn't even work out that way. The, the thing that I used to help me, so I've conducted more than 60 interviews. Um, I've uh, like, at, I should have counted like at least 20 pages, I think here, all footnotes and very small print. So I consulted a lot of sources as well. Um, Scrivener was my best friend. I, I really loved Scrivener. Um, for those Excuse of you, me, can you explain yeah. what that is for people? Yes, Scrivener is like this, um, it's like this, system with like a bunch of post-it notes, electronical post-it notes that you can move and arrange anywhere you want to um, on your computer. And it, if you decide that you talk to like Bob, you know, do I want Bob to say this in chapter two or in chapter 10? So you move him from chapter two to chapter 10. So you're like literally moving pages um, and interviews and facts while still keeping the structure consistent and keeping this a sense of your overall project. I find that a lot of writers use it even when they write fiction and they want to kind of move scenes around. You can look at it visually, you can look at it by chapter, by quote. It's a really, really cool tool. Um, it really helped me keep everything organized because things did, did change. The overall structure of my book stayed the same. It had a personal story. It had advice from excerpts, uh, sorry, experts that I've um, wanted to convey. It had advice from other parents, sometimes different types of advice. Um, and it had some just relatable stories. So I wanted those three to be present. And that's something that I did end up, I feel, achieving from, you know, from the conception to, to delivery, to use uh, birthing terminology. Uh, we won't get into centimeters. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Zach, you can edit that out. Um, so um, so uh, in terms of research, um, because so you have, a, so, okay. How did you find the people, um, the experts? I get how you found, found them, but how did you approach them? And, and the lay people, I guess we could call them, the, the regular, you know, the other parents, how did you find them? Um, and we know how to find publications. So how did you find and approach experts and how did you find and approach um, regular people for, whatever, for a lack of whatever? Yeah, I, I feel like, so um, I used to work um, as a journalist full-time, so I was sort of, I'm kind of like internet sleuthing is something I enjoy doing um, and looking for sources, but this was a really challenging project. Uh, I basically, I'm terrified of errors, which is also why I hired my own fact checker for the project. So I wanted to make sure that the people I find and the research I find is like the latest and the most um, reputable for um, the expert side, I did a couple of different things. I've, um, I looked at like the Linguistic Society of America, SOC, who works there. I looked at the most, um, like the think tanks, for example, Migration Policy Institute. Um, I also wanted to make sure that it's aligned with, you know, it's either, it's, that it's either progressive, I would say, or politically neutral, preferably. So I could get objective advice. There was some organizations that claim to study certain subjects, but they're incredibly, you know, leaning towards the other side, which is, is not something that I wanted. I wanted something very balanced. So I approached them. They would connect me with their expert sources. Another thing I did is I literally started searching on course syllabi for 
graduate and undergraduate courses in the last several years to see what textbooks those people were reading and assigning. Um, whether it has to do with you know, immigration history and policy, sociology, um, bilingualism. And eventually I started seeing the same books over and over recommended. And then I bought those books. I started so I, citing from them. I also approached some of the people that wrote those actual books, um, including one that, that turned out to be at my alma mater in New York, um, and citing them or sometimes going to interview them. Sometimes it was just Googling and seeing who is available and cold calling them um, if, you know, if they had reputable, like a, an established background. Also, I'm a member of a Facebook group for writers, um, female or non-binary female identifying writers, which was incredibly useful to sometimes I would post call outs there. Hey, got, hey uh, people, can you recommend me so-and-so expert? Um, in terms of people, I've, um, I, parents or non uh, Individuals who are not experts. Um, some of them are actually not even parents. Some of them are not even coupled. They're not in a relationship. So it's not all parents. I, a few people I spoke to that I knew uh, that were friends. Some of people were able to connect me with friends of friends. And some connected me to friends of friends of friends. Also, I, I know Twitter can be like a dark hole, but Twitter was so amazing while I was writing this book because I literally put out calls and um, people just came to my aid. They, you know, retweeted me or um, said, hey, that's me, I can talk to you. So I was able to do a lot of amazing interviews based on that. I conducted more than 60 interviews, like I think I mentioned. Um, most, about half of them were in person, just under half. I was hoping more would be in person, but because of COVID, a few were, um, were able to be that way. But the ones that were in person did portray that you know, sense of place and capture the personality of the individuals. Um, which I was, which I'm really grateful for. Um, so I just want to say, because uh, if you want to throw questions in the in the chat now, as I said, if you could put like question in all caps, uh, my middle aged self would appreciate it. But if you have questions, throw them in, um, and I will ask them. Um, okay, so so your your book is a combination of your words, uh, lay people words, expert words. Um, how did you find the balance as a writer? How, how did you find the balance? Were there chapters where you were like, oh, I have a lot to say about this. Um, how did you find the balance of, of what to put where? How much, how, how, I just think I said balance four times, so I'm gonna stop talking. It was so hard to do. I, 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 I paid attention to, um, that I wanted to make sure there is at least a little bit of a personal story in every chapter, either in the beginning or the middle. Um, and in terms of how many, I didn't have like, you know, like a proportion of how many would be of ex experts and how many of just lay people. Um, it just kind of came together, but I did some, some, I did so much reshuffling. For example, I had some amazing interviews um, with people and sometimes I'd have to split them up. Like here's when they talk about language. Here's where they talk about culture. Here's where they talk about their meddling parents who are trying to convince them to do something they don't want to do with their baby. Um, and I had to split them up and make sure that they weren't repetitive and they were interesting. I did end up cutting a lot of scenes out. Um, it, it, these are such sensitive topics, right? A parenting book, there's always somebody who does it differently. Uh, bilingualism, people have different approaches. Um, immigration, all immigrants are different, right? Our journeys are different. So this, there's also a chapter on discrimination where people talk about the racism they've encountered um, of different types, how they handled it, um, whether it's in the receiving society, which is the United States, or even within those immigrant enclaves, sometimes there's discrimination, reverse discrimination, you know, like in terms of can you marry outside our culture? It was very, very important to me to not own people's stories because I do not own anybody's story, I own my own. So I was very, very conscious of using people's words verbatim and quoting them um, in what they were saying um, so that I'm not appropriating their story and I'm simply providing the space, the non-judgmental space I'm hoping to share and tie it into the larger narrative. So I'll get to the chat in just a moment, but just a quick question on, on interviews. 
did you record? How did you, how, how did you, uh, because if you record, you have to transcribe. How did you capture the actual uh, quotations? Uh, the majority of the interviews I transcribe, uh, I recorded, but I also transcribed them by hand because I'm very paranoid about losing things. Um, and then there's a system that I use, um, otter.ai. It's a transcription service. I'm sorry, can you, can you spell yes, it? Yes, I can even type it in. It's uh, right. into the know. message. Yeah, it's called otter.ai. I think that's the website. It literally oh, transcribes otter. the interviews. Yeah, and if you have like a certain number for free that's available. But even if you have to, like I ended up paying because I had a lot. Um, it understands like up to 95 or 90% of what people say, unless you have an accent. <laughs> And then that doesn't understand that much. <laughs> and back yeah. to the beginning, right? Right, right. But it's a, it's still so much so much more helpful than like transcribing everything by hand. It saved my fingers for sure because there was so much typing and hours and hours of interviews. Um, but I highly recommend it for anybody who'd like to transcribe it. Um, and then as soon as I would do finish the interview, I would record it on my phone. I would email it or mess, drop it in the Dropbox again because I'm just terrified of losing information or um, misstating facts. Um, so here's a here's a quick and easy question. Um, is that face, Facebook group open? I have a feeling I know what it is, and it's supposed to be secret, but it's not. It's I think one has to be invited by a member, and they have to be friends with that person um, uh, to be invited. So it's a secret, technically like a secret group, and they have been written about. Uh, some members feel <laughs> strongly about not being written about. Others say it's okay because we're here to support other writers. So it's 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 a face. It, there's a there's a main group with fifty thousand people and yeah. hundred smaller groups. We can talk about this uh, after at the end of, at, at the end of this after we stop recording. I'm happy to, to explain what it is because it's uh, not clandestine. It's it is supportive, um, yeah. and there are lots of there are hundreds of hundreds of these groups. So um, stick around and we'll talk. Um, okay, oh, okay. So what were your main questions for your interviews? For you lay, know, people, lay, lay people interviews. Lay people, you know, that really just depended. Um, I typically, it, it just really depended on what I already knew about them um, or what they wanted to convey. And sometimes I would just have to jump in and, and try to, um, you know, improvise on the spot. Obviously I asked, um, you know, some of the questions that I've asked maybe that were more common uh, are, if you have a child, you know, do you, what do you impart from your culture? Have you had any struggle? Do you wish you did more with your native language or languages? Have you ever encountered discrimination? Or like, how old were you when you came? Um, what do you hope to, yeah do you feel like you've acculturated? Um, who do you feel, do you socialize with? And, um, you know, a lot of these questions seem very straightforward, but people that I've asked, and some of them are people who are very, um, I would say self-aware, reflective, they really struggle to answer those questions. After the interview, typically people would get back to me to follow up, say, oh, you know, this made me think of this that I wanted to add, or this made me really realize that I never thought of this. Other people just stalled. Um, either because the questions are very difficult um, emotionally and, or other times I just didn't think about it. Like the stories of, you know, loss and grief and leaving your family or having to reinvent yourself. Be like people don't like to think about it or how challenging it was when they first arrived. Um, even I was surprised after I read certain texts um, by um, cultural psychologists, for example, a John Barry is one that I really admire. I was like, oh, that's actually how I acculturated, but I feel like I've completely um, tried to like not even think about it and just suppress it. <laughs> um, but that made me realize a lot. Or I would ask people simple questions like, who do you socialize with? Where are the people from? Are they mostly American? Are they from a different culture like yours or the same language group? A lot of times people just were not even aware of that. And they started thinking and they'd be like, oh yeah, this is actually what I do. Um, it brought up a lot of feelings um, and I think some trauma as well, but in a, in a positive way, I'd like to think because um, I try not to pry and then say, here's, okay, thanks for your answers, goodbye. Um, I tried to be very understanding in the way I ask questions and I conduct interviews, hopefully. And the majority uh, were in almost half, like I said, were in person 
um, in the home typically or in a park or class um, and some were on the phone and or in video there were a few that were written which are not as personal but still some people prefer that um, and some people feel like they can give more honest and uh, thoughtful answers that way and whatever the, the medium is that the person wants is one that I respect and, and welcome. So Masha, was there anything um, in any of the interviews that surprised you and sort of shifted your direction? Yeah, I think the trauma of immigration and the was one of the things that really surprised me. Um, and the fact that sometimes we're just so not, there's not as much self-awareness about our path because there's so much that people try to maybe hide or not think about um, in terms of where, you know, where we fit culturally, what we want for our kids, how do we feel about our heritage in our home? That was surprising. I was also surprised to see among many things is how much people are, how people, how much people worry about passing their heritage to their children. Um, there was a family, um, a mother that said she doesn't really care so much about, you know, she teaching her child uh, Bengali because she's uh, from India and her partner is too, but using English is not something, using English is like the priority for them. But, um, and that's something that was really important to her. But for the majority of the people, whether their kids are fluent in their native language or not, had a very, very emotional reaction to it. Um, everybody was concerned, am I doing enough? And if I'm not, you know, am I a bad person for not passing my language down to the next generation? So it was just a very, a very, sensitive topic for people. Um, that was very surprising. Um, and I think also just the fierceness, and this is this just goes, you know, in the face of a lot of dogma we hear, especially in the last few years, um, about immigrants and vilification of immigrants that I think a lot of us have heard, um, maybe not as much recently, but certainly in recent years. Um, everybody that I spoke to, it was so fiercely just happy to be here. Yes, there are problems. Um, yes, people are still connected to their native culture in one way or another, I wish they were, but people identify themselves as also American or exclusively American. And they are just, they feel you know patriotic and grateful, whatever that means to them. In fact, um, I, a lot of these interviews, not all, but a lot I had to con conduct during COVID where things were <laughs> obviously bad for, and hard for us all, but this, this optimism, this resilience, this desire to reinvent yourself and um, you know, hold on to the best of both cultures is really gave me so much optimism and excitement as I was completing the project. I feel like it was also like a personal healing uh, method for me to work on the book. I could just sit down and start typing or researching or transcribing and I would be transformed into like a very, very positive world, which really kept me, helped me keep going during this time. So a very quick question and the more complicated one. So um, how old were you when you came to the US? And as an unrelated question, um, but uh, so as a journalist, but also as a person who feels passionately about this, and you're talking about these very emotional um, issues, very deep issues, how as a writer did you balance um, emotion and uh, someone fill in a word there? So I was 13 and a half. journalism, writing journalism. Yeah, um, I was 13 and a half when I came. Um, so teenager. And I arrived straight to California. I know some people who came from the United uh, from the former Soviet Union just a couple years earlier, they would have to go through a lengthy period where they were in Europe for like half a year in Austria, Italy, not knowing where they're going to settle, um, but particularly Jew Jewish um, Russian speaking immigrants, but I came straight to California. Um, so balancing journal fact and emotion, that's very hard, but I think isn't that also what makes for a really powerful narrative, right? Um, I think sometimes it just flows, other times something is just too dry and then I cut it and I try to add, you know, a sense of scene, like a sense of place, a scene building, a quote, a description of a person or a voice or some kind of a detail to balance it out and make it still objective and still factually correct, but at the same time balanced with this 
rawness of emotion that you can hopefully feel through the page. And there were so many revisions that would like put it down and then come back to it and like scratch it out or move it on that Scrivener system to fit different parts um, of the project until I felt it was right. I ended up cutting a lot as well. The project was way longer. Um, like my own personal stories, I felt so vulnerable about some of them. So I like deleted them or I felt there were too many personal stories and I needed more fact. It, it's, it's like a very delicate balance. So, uh, so where did your editor come in or agent, editor, whoever, where did that, in terms of what you thought versus what um, they thought would sell? You know, my editor had very few edits actually. She, she said that she, she really loved the idea. She said from the very start, um, she said that even if I don't end up working with the publishing house, which I wanted to from the very beginning, she would still want to buy the book. Um, but she was, uh, you know, she was an amazing champion for this project and she still is. Um, the Beacon Press, Rachel Marks, um, who also worked in White Fragility. Um, she had feedback, of course, but more like, um, you know, can you make this more clear? Can you provide a date? Um, you know, move things here and there, of course. Um, at the outset, she asked me, do I plan to speak to so-and-so people? Um, and, you know, I wanted to make sure that's included. But she was, she said she, like, so she was really surprised to say she was pleased with overall um, the shape of the manuscript when she saw the first draft. So there were, there was feedback and edits, but not a huge significant amount. Um, okay, from the chat. What do you want this book to accomplish for readers? And I'm gonna I'm gonna actually expand on that because that uh, hits one of my questions as well. Is uh, who did you think uh, was your audience, and has is that how it turned out to be? So again, what do you want the book to accomplish? Um, and also, who did you who were you writing this for, and who who has where has it landed? So my initial goal was to help immigrants whether their parents or not feel less like aliens <laughs> um, and uh, to have something to relate to and commiserate with um, and maybe understand their situation better and their experiences and have it be in a safe place um, and make them realize that a lot of people go through this there I haven't up until the point seen too much narrative about actually no I didn't see much narrative at all um, about the contemporary immigrant experience written in a nonfiction format so I knew from my conversations and from my experience, there was a huge need for that. Um, I mean, like one, one out of four kids now has a parent, at least one parent that's born outside of the United States. And uh, one out of five people in America are age five and over speak a language other than English at home. So there's definitely the need. Um, so I think relate, not, not advice. I mean, if they learn something that's fantastic, but just something to help them feel less alone and more understood and maybe even amused in the process. Um, and in terms of the second question, um, sorry, could you repeat that one more time? <laughs> I got off track. Which was the second one? Um, so we were talking about, I, I was talking about um, who, who did you want to reach? And then the, the yeah. specific question was, uh, what do you want this book to accomplish for readers? I feel like you might've sort of woven yeah. it together. So who I wanted to reach, I wanted to reach um, immigrants, initially immigrant parents like myself, um, who had children who were fairly young or who were, you know, maybe not quite adults yet. But in the process, I realized this book resonated and my interviews resonated with a lot more people. Some had um, adult children, um, some had no children, some just wanted to share horror dating stories of uh, trying to date from a, somebody from a different culture. Um, there were quite a few of those. Um, eventually I realized that there was so much interest, even from people who were second generation, who still grew up in a different a home with a different culture or cultures, and they wanted to make sense of themselves, why they do the things they do, they eat the foods that, that they eat, you know, how they're influenced um, by their parents or who wanted to understand their own parents better in their journey. So there are quite a few, there are a few interviews also with second generation Amer immigrants who were born in the United States and who are maybe like have certain feelings about the languages of their um, ancestors that they're trying to learn and their customs that they're trying to learn or were brought up with. Um, 
let's go so back it to widened. the widened. It widened. Yeah. The, the, yeah. I just, I, I, I want to keep going there, but I, I, a lot of things I want to ask you. So, okay. <laughs> let's go back to the, let's go back to the structure of the book. Um, so um, you have chapter titles, uh, which are, um, they're, they're, they're references to American culture. And then you have uh, quotations, which are not necessarily references to American culture. So uh, what was that? What was that about? How did that, how did that come to be? Um, and what did you want to accomplish with it? And can you describe it better than I did? Yes, thank you. So each uh, some of the some of the chapter titles are kind of cheeky, like the "I am the Grinch stole Christmas," but then there is also something called the Polyglot Boarding House, which is um, I think Teddy Roosevelt was saying in the you know during the time of World War One, like this is not America is not a polyglot boarding house. You must learn English and English only. Um, this was kind of the call uh, towards monolingualism. Um, like if you're here, you should not be hyphenated American. You should just be American, which is also something I described in the book. Um, so some of the ch so chapter titles are kind of cheeky and you know relate to the culture. I don't remember if I ever kept the Mary Poppins quote. I um, I meant to. I actually forgot <laughs> if I did or not. But um, each chapter, there are fourteen chapters plus a preface. Each chapter begins with a quotation that is sort of relevant to the text. Um, and it's usually a writer, um, an immigrant writer. I sought to have a group of, a representative group that I think shows a diversity of different cultures and voices. There is Dina and Gestu, who are an Ethiopian born author that I really admire. Um, there was uh, Andi, uh, Anya, Anya Yazierska, who was a, a Russian Jewish, um, immigrant author at the turn of the 20th century. Um, there's uh, Viet Tan Nguyen, a Vietnamese American author. So I wanted to kind of prop up my writing the, uh, the words of authors that I really admire, but also at the same time related and kind of introduce each chapter because the quote somewhat related to the chapter that's ahead. Um, so when I, when I think about how, how, you, how you structured this, um, and you were talking about all the interviews and all, all the research you did. Um, there's a trope, a writing trope, right? Kill your darlings. Yeah. So for uh, so what that means is that you 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 have to take things that you just love that you wrote and cut them out because it doesn't serve the book. Um, what was your experience with that? And do you have like files that you want to get back to, or what? Did you have to kill your darlings? Oh, I had to like go at them to the next. So it was so hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was challenging. Um, a lot of things, a lot of things I had to cut out um, because they were either they would they would make my family not very happy, <laughs> my family members, or they were just too revealing. Or you know, I thought they were like, "Oh, this is so funny," and it's also true. But then I realized maybe it's just best to like stay in the journal, in my journal, <laughs> in my private journals, um, than be uh, discussed because um, it would just be too revealing, or maybe not even necessary. Um, I feel like there was a fairly decent balance how I like that I came to, which had the you know the balance of personal versus interviews. Other interviews I also had to cut out, even though I may have loved them so much, just because I didn't want like one interviewee or family to feel like they're being put on the spot because these are all very personal questions not like tell me I don't know what what like when you go shopping what do you buy like for groceries these are like really intense and very personal things and some of the names by the way have been changed um, at the request of the interviewee except for the expert sources their names are fully there as they appear um, yeah, and some of these pieces I either just plan to, I've actually also started putting them into separate essays, I might save them maybe for another book in the future, um, but I have had to cut out quite a bit. So that actually brings me to a question in the chat, it says many immigrants, um, ah, okay, ah, my, my thing, screen just jumped up, they come in three generation families, the elder generations may have some of the same roadblocks as their grandchildren, such as navigation of adult daycare. Um, might you focus on the older generation of immigrant, immigrants in another book? 
Um, that is a that is a very good question. Um, I def this book definitely does talk about. There is a chapter that talks about preschools and like actually daycares for you know younger children and toddlers and babies. Then there is a section on preschools, but adult daycares and how do people deal with um, the older generations and how how do they you know, especially when they need their need of assistance, there's certainly cultural differences, right? Um, you know, how different cultures treat the elder members of their families. And maybe it's actually, I haven't thought of it, but that would be a really interesting and a very important um, topic, definitely. And a lot of generations, a lot of families do dwell together under one roof, uh, many generations, whether it's because of financial difficulties um, or because that's just what they're used to. And this is, who provides like grandma provides childcare, right? Um, or maybe they're just used to living together. Um, certainly when I was growing up for, for um, quite a bit of time when I was still living in Russia, there were like four, I think four generations at one point living in one apartment. Not because like, I mean, we couldn't get another apartment for a while obviously because they weren't available, but that's also just what people did. You just sometimes subdivided a room with a little screen and, um, or the living room would become the bedroom at night. Um, yeah, so that's definitely more common than in a lot of American households when you're 18 and you know off you go. So this is just a teaser for the book. Um, Masha, is, you're describing this this uh, very particular culture, culture, and I think a really interesting part of the book um, is what happens when you uh, mix that up with um, American culture when you is it intermarrying I'm not sure is that when you when you have a household you know when you have a household with these two different cultures um just a, just a teaser that that's in the book but um do you want to speak to that before I get to more questions about craft or um of course yes there is some of it mentioned um the effect of multiple generations and you know who provides a child care when parents have to or choose to go back to work, um, how dwelling together might be, um, you know, affect uh, educational outcomes. And so I did rely for a lot of, for quite a bit of that, I relied on the research by um, Professor um, Philip Kassanitz, who teaches at the City University of New York Graduate Center. He is a presidential scholar of sociology. So he did a, a fantastic book that I love called um, it's it's about the um, New Yorkers um, immigrant uh, coming coming of age. Uh, let me actually reference that right here. Um, Inheriting the city, it's called. Uh, so I highly recommend it. It's research based, but you can also find his um, talks on YouTube, and he's quoted often in the, the media. So Philip Kassinitz is a really great source for that that I used. Um, so I always start to feel pressured at this point in the, in the chat because I want to get to everything. Um, so someone asked how to get in touch with you. What's the best way? And I'm guessing your website? Sure. My website is um, masharumor.com. I'll type it in. Perfect. .com or my email um, on my first name, last name. The rumor is with an, e, with an E, not an O. Although people have made jokes. Um, have you heard the rumor about rumor? Not really useful when you're a reporter. <laughs> but, you know, it's in the name. So... Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna mash together two questions which are not together. Um, so, did most people in the book uh, choose to use their names? How did you handle handle uh, anonymity? Um, and then there's a question about um, how long did it take you to write the entire book? Did you have a publisher lined up? Basically, what was your publishing journey? Oh my goodness, I, I'll try to be very separate questions. Sure. Yes, names. Um, I offered anonymity um, to everybody who was not um, an ex expert. Um, and uh, most, I would say a lot of people chose to be, to use their real names, maybe half and half, I would say. And um, each person that I interviewed that was more than just a quote or two had to sign an official release. Oh. Um, yeah, um, that I would then share with my publisher. So everybody gave their consent. Um, if it's, unless it's like a really fairly short interview. Um, and then some instances I changed their first name and in a couple of instances I changed their uh, uh, profession, like their, um, 
basically what they do for a living. But everything else stayed the same. Nothing else changed. Uh, there was definitely factual integrity. That's very important, like where they lived, where they're from, how long they've lived here, their children, the marital status, and so on. So sometimes the name has changed. Um, occasionally their uh, job title has changed just because the story is like, in some cases, like, uh, you know, there are some sexual experiences, you know, that's not something they feel comfortable necessarily disclosing. Um, for the um, experts that I used, I also had them sign releases, but there's one other thing I did. After I spoke to them and transcribed the interviews, I actually sent the transcript back to them to specify. It's not for you to like edit and you know change in any way you want, but just can you please point out if there are any inaccuracies? Because the last thing a scholar, for example, or researcher wants is just something to be published that's not accurate. Um, and also it was an opportunity for me, if it's something like cognitive psychology or bilingualism to correct any errors or maybe the latest research that I may have not have accounted for since I interviewed them. So, and it was a pretty smooth process. Not very few people changed anything. Some just maybe clarified or added something, um, but yeah. So, so excuse me. So when you, so say you interviewed 60 people, Yes. let's say 50 or 40 of them ended up in the book. Um, I think, no, just about everybody. One person, I had this incredibly, he was a dreamer. Um, and it was a very emotional interview because I've spoken to him actually before when he was younger and I reached out to him some years later. Um, it was, I think it was just a very emotional interview. And then he ended up not giving me the consent that was signed. I think he probably felt very, that maybe it was his story to tell. He didn't want to share it even though initially he agreed. So he probably changed his mind and I did not use any of that interview at all in the book. Um, so, yeah. No, I didn't mean that as, as a challenge. I just meant, you know, I'm sure you got a lot of uh, oh, yeah, yeah. that you couldn't use, but so, yeah. so when you talked about uh, a release, um, so with the auditory interviews you did with people, what, what in terms of, what did you send them? It was a release form from my publisher that says that I permit you to use my interview in the book. So um, that may be, there might be people in this chat who are like, of course, Amy, but I didn't know that. So yeah, yeah. So it was very, uh, like, I, like, I held myself to the highest regard. And if I, for uh, myself, the highest, my, my, my transcripts in the highest regard, not myself. <laughs> um, so if I, even if I transcribed something, and if I couldn't make out a word, I listened to it sometimes like 20 times to make sure I understand it. Um, one interview I conducted in Spanish, even though I have no Spanish. So I actually had somebody translate it for me. Um, and I wanted to make sure I find the right translation. Um, if I didn't know a certain word in a certain language, I would always go back and recheck it. So I'm obviously hoping that everything is factually correct, but the integrity of people's words is, is of utmost importance, um, which is partly what you know the releases serve. And I also gave people back the copies of the releases so they can have them. So we have time for one more question and I'm gonna do the Zach Powers trademark um, virtual craft chat question, which is, um, was there anything in your writing that you did deliberately that no one noticed? I love that question. Um, okay. So first of it's all, mine, not it's Zach's. It's mine. <laughs> Thank you. Amy. Um, so the first pair chapter was the only one written in the past tense. Everything else is in present before coming to America and then present tense starting in America. There is also a reference, um, in the, first chapter when my family and I are I'm not going to say doing what working and there is a street address that start that has a house number 740 so it might not mean much to most people but in fact 740 is the name of a very famous Jewish klezmer song in the Soviet Union um, and it's about somebody arriving there are many theories but it's somebody is arriving on the train and the train is arriving at 740 and he's going to come so the train makes it, its appearance throughout the narrative many times, and it's almost like a symbol of moving and relocation and finding yourself in motion and flux. So that was like a little quote to signify this Jewishness and um, you know transient nature of being an immigrant. I think you should wrap it there. That's just perfect. Um, Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. Um, well, there's Zach throwing in the buy the book link and 
oh my gosh, after this discussion, you should all buy the book and write reviews. And then we should all get back together again to talk about the substance of the book because the issues are so interesting and so um, around us. Um, so yeah, congratulations. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amy and Zach and the writers, such a, it was such a, an honor to be here. I really appreciate it. And thank you all who joined us today. I'm so happy to see you.